Although ceramic heat emitters and heat mats do have applications, they are not suitable as standalone heaters for reptiles, and in today's video I'm going to be explaining precisely why. Now before we get into specifics about the products themselves, there's a couple of key little concepts that I'll have to explain. So first and foremost, what actually is heat? Quite simply, heat is just energy in the form of radiation, i.e. the energy carried by photons, or it exists as vibrations between molecules, which in fluids leads to convection and in solids leads to conduction. When heat is in the form of vibrations in particles, it can be spread between these particles by contact between them, sort of like how speed is spread between snooker balls as they hit each other. When radiation becomes vibrations in molecules, it has to be absorbed by them. Exactly how this absorption occurs depends on both the photon, i.e. its wavelength, and the molecule concerned, so different molecules will absorb different wavelengths to different degrees. So the funny thing about this then, is that even though any photon is heat in a sense, it won't warm things up to the same degree. And to this effect, infrared tends to warm objects up because the molecules that are on Earth tend to absorb those wavelengths, whereas ultraviolet or visible light, say, which are still a form of heat, aren't absorbed to the same degree and therefore don't tend to warm things up the same. You still with me? Good. Now then, when something gets hot, it will begin to eject that energy as radiation and convection. The radiation emitted contains photons of wavelengths spanning most of the electromagnetic spectrum, but with a cutoff at some of the shorter wavelengths and a peak around one particular wavelength. The hotter an object is, the further to the left on the graph the peak will be, and the further to the left the cutoff will be, meaning that more of the shorter wavelengths are emitted. And this explains why things go from being red hot, when they are a reasonably low temperature, to being white hot because when they are a lower temperature, the, the cutoff appears right about the red part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and as it gets hotter, more and more visible light is given off, making it appear that white colour. Now, because shorter wavelengths carry with them less energy than longer wavelengths, as an object gets hotter, the proportion of energy lost from that object as radiation increases. But that doesn't really sound like it's got anything to do with reptiles, so let's tie it all together. The sun radiates photons with wavelengths spanning the entire electromagnetic spectrum as we know it, but not all of these get through the atmosphere. The wavelengths that do make it through the atmosphere are those spanning from and including ultraviolet B and infrared B, and together they make up optical radiation. These wavelengths are then all absorbed to different degrees by the objects on Earth, making them a little bit hotter. As a result, all of these terrestrial objects then begin to release energy themselves in the form of radiation and convection. Now, because the temperature of these objects tends not to be very high, the radiation is all emitted with a peak at a very long wavelength indeed, so the radiation comes off in the form of infrared C and not any of the other shorter wavelengths. This means that, in terms of radiation, a reptile will be exposed to plenty of infrared A from the sun, as well as quite a bit of infrared B, and then it will also have a very much smaller amount of infrared C coming out of the objects around it. Of course, it will also be able to feel conduction by directly touching objects and convection through the vibrations of air molecules around it, or perhaps water molecules for aquatic or amphibious species. Now do us all a favour and keep that in your heads for your sec while we pop back to the R graph. Now all of our heaters that we use for reptiles are black body emitters, but in and of themselves they reach different specific temperatures and therefore have different emission curves. Out of all of our heaters, tungsten filament lamps reach the highest temperature themselves, so their peak is at the shortest wavelength, in this case being in infrared A. The cutoff is somewhere in UVA, so they not only provide plenty of near-infrared, they also provide the entirety of the visible spectrum, just with a sort of skew to red. This is why we're able to see some of the radiation coming off from them, and it appears a sort of orangey colour. Carbon filament lamps, like the Arcadia Deep Heat Projector, run at a slightly lower temperature, and therefore their peak is slightly lower down and further to the right, i.e. in favour of longer wavelengths. 
This is evidenced by the fact that the cutoff is just about in the visible portion of the spectrum. So when a deep heat projector or another form of carbon filament lamp is running at its maximum temperature, you can just about see some light coming off from it. Ceramic heat emitters and heat mats run at yet lower temperatures, so their peak is far lower down and also far further into the longer wavelengths, meaning that they provide almost entirely infrared C. Clearly then, much less of the energy being relieved from a ceramic heat emitter or heat mat is in the form of radiation than in the case of tungsten or carbon filament lamps. But hang on a second. Power is the rate of energy transfer, so if I've got a 100 watt ceramic heat emitter and a 100 watt tungsten bulb, then both of them have to be relieving energy at the same rate. But then if a ceramic heat emitter is losing much less energy as radiation than a tungsten bulb, where is the rest of the energy? Well, the funny thing is, if you trace the emission curve further and further into the longer wavelengths, there becomes a point where it is no longer radiation and what you are looking at is actually convection. So a ceramic heat emitter actually loses lots of its energy in the form of straight up vibrations in the air molecules around it. And this, if you've ever wondered, is why they sell ceramic heat emitters with those weird wire cage thingies. It's because convection isn't suitable for reflection in the same way that radiation is, so you can't efficiently reflect the heat energy given off by a ceramic. And now that you understand all of that, we can properly discuss which heater you should be using with your reptile. Now we do know from experience that a ceramic heat emitter or heat mat can be used to get a reptile up to working temperature, but not only is this completely unnatural as it doesn't replicate the sun, there are quite a few important benefits that you're missing out on. Firstly and most obviously, the complete lack of visible light provided by a ceramic heat emitter or heat mat means that it will be more difficult for a reptile to tell where its warm spot is. This is more apparent for heliocentric species such as bearded dragons, which tend to bask openly in the sun, but it will also affect the lives of more crepuscular species like leopard geckos. The next thing is that neither of these heaters provide infrared A or infrared B. Now this is a bad thing firstly because infrared A and infrared B just feel nice, they feel as nice to a reptile as they do to you or I. So for example if you go outside on a sunny day and feel the sun tingling against you, that is the feeling that your reptiles are missing out on if you don't provide them with those shorter infrared wavelengths. Another drawback of missing out on these is that infrared A particularly is known to have healing effects. So if you're not providing a reptile with this, you can often notice that cuts and abrasions will last for longer. So for example, if your reptile comes out of hibernation and has got some scale rot or something, then this can take a while to clear up. And I have actually seen this myself with my corn snake. I did use to heat red with a ceramic heat emitter, but when he came out of brumation I did switch him over to some tungsten filament lamps, which do of course provide that all important near infrared, and he almost instantly seemed to heal over. Because heat in the form of vibrations can only spread between different molecules or particles by direct contact between them, if you're trying to heat a reptile through convection or conduction, it will take quite a long time for its core body temperature to reach what it's got to be. On the other hand, if you mainly provide heat through radiation, or perhaps in conjunction with vibrations through molecules, the radiation can actually penetrate straight deep into the tissues, so it can achieve a core body temperature much more rapidly. Because of this, ceramic heat emitters which rely mainly on convection and heat mats which rely mainly on conduction are not very good at heating up a reptile efficiently. Now in captivity, the easiest way of providing all of these benefits to a reptile is simply to heat it with a tungsten filament lamp. As I talked about in my last video where we targeted bearded dragon heating and lighting, the best tungsten lamps that you can go for are the ones that spread heat and light over the broadest, most even area possible. I found through a bit of experimentation that the best for this are bulbs like these and also pearl effect globe shaped bulbs housed in a reflective fitting. 
To allow your reptile to have a proper day-night cycle, you will have to turn this heater off at night, but in most instances, nighttime heating for reptiles isn't really necessary anyway. If, however, you're like me and your reptile room actually gets really, really cold, so you do need nighttime heating occasionally, then this is where other heaters like ceramic heat emitters and deep heat projectors actually come into their own. Although they aren't suitable for providing a basking spot, they are okay for upping those ambient temps. To run a tungsten filament lamp safely, you want to plug it into a dimming thermostat. My favourite model for this is the Havistat Classic dimming thermostat, as over the years these have proven to be the most reliable for me. A dimming thermostat will actually precisely control the power output of the filament lamp, so that it is not turning on and off, which can shorten the life of the bulb, and is also really quite irritating. To ensure that you're getting the most out of your heater, make sure that you pop down a little big, little big, a big piece of rock or a rock stack so that this can absorb energy and then pass it on to your reptile food conduction because of course conduction is a natural process and we don't want to miss this out. To that end, heat mats actually can be used as a targeted spot to provide heat through conduction but exactly how you're meant to do this is something that I'll discuss in another video because for this video that is just about it. So hopefully, if you were confused about which heater you need for your reptile, that has cleared things up. Um, if you do have any further questions, then don't be afraid to leave them in the comment section and I'll get to you. But for now, like the video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, because I've been JTP Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye guys! Oh, and while you're still here, do me a favour and let me know what you think about this new rig. I've got this microphone now, so who fancies some crackle? I don't know how you can hear that, it sounds like not in real life. Ooh, exposure. Uh, but yeah, you can see all the vivs now and stuff, so I don't know, hopefully it looks better, but what I think doesn't matter, you tell me.